Hello and welcome to another episode. Today we're talking about the differences between the consumer Super 8 millimeter format and the more commercial 16 millimeter format. Some of you might have seen my other video about Super 8. And if you don't want to spend the time watching this video, let's just say I'm not really a fan of Super 8. And you can go back to that video and watch it and, and kind of see the reasons why. But today is all about Super 8 and 16 millimeter. And, and the reason why this is so important is because of this old theory that 16 millimeter costs a lot more money than Super 8 does in 2020, okay? And so today we're going to dispel some of those issues and we're going to try to compare the formats a little bit and discuss some of the pros and cons of each format. Let's talk about the technical differences between Super 8 and 16 millimeter. Now we obviously know that 16 millimeter is twice the width of Super 8. 16 millimeter also has almost four times the amount of image of Super 8, which is quite a bit more. Super 8 is in a cartridge, which means that you don't have to thread a camera. 16 millimeter is either on a daylight spool or on a core in a can that has to be loaded in a changing bag into a magazine. Super 8 was always a reversal format from the very beginning. It was Kodachrome and Ektachrome. And Kodachrome cannot be processed as color anymore. Ektachrome can though. So you could go out and buy old stock and you can process it all you want, but Kodachrome's always gonna come out as black and white. Even though it's black or reversal, it's still black and white. But with 16 millimeter, you can buy color negative stocks that, you know, from 30 years ago, that still works. You can save a little bit of money on stock, no problem at all. And it'll still process using current technology and get you a color image. Super 8 millimeter, was designed and built as an 18 frame a second format. 16 millimeter has had many different frame rates, but most people shoot at 24, which is the standard theatrical way of shooting. If you're shooting at 18 frames a second, of course, Super 8 millimeter is gonna be cheaper than 16 millimeter price per finished minute. But a lot of people shoot Super 8 at 24 frames a second, which means 150 foot cartridge is basically a minute and a half. And that's not a lot of film to do something with. So Super 8 millimeter has a lot of pros in terms of shooting. One, cameras are relatively small. That's, that's a big pro. Uh, two, you don't have to shoot a lot of film to get it processed, meaning that your roll of film is not a lot of film. So you can keep your costs down per roll of film. So if you want to just shoot two rolls of film a year or something like that, it's relatively cheap to shoot. Um, Super 8 does have reversal stocks available like 16 as well that allow you to project directly from and super projectors are relatively inexpensive which is another pro on super 8 side plus i think in today's world um you know with modern stocks i think super 8 looks okay um it kind of has this old school home movie vibe that you can't really get with 16 and above so if you're going for that vibe i guess that's a pro about super 8 but that's kind of where it, the divide starts. So once you start shooting more than just one or two rolls of film a year, once you start wanting to have some quality in your image, um, a stable image especially, you kind of have to sort of push Super 8 kind of to the side. And I know a lot of people, especially YouTube people, really like Super 8 because they can just go and experiment for cheap money, and I get that. But that's kind of 16 millimeters department. You know, the whole point of 16 is that you can experiment with it because the cameras that are available on the market for it allow that experimentation. A camera like the Bolex, which allows you to go backwards and forwards and do special effects in camera, doesn't really exist for Super 8. Yes, there are some cameras in the market that allow you to do some cool things, but nothing like the Bolex. So, and then with 16 millimeter, you know, home processing makes a lot more sense with 16 because the film is so much larger that when you kind of process it and, and wash it and dry it, um, that whole process damages the film less because it's such a bigger, thicker material. So for home processing, 16 millimeter is a better idea anyway. You know, Super 8's a little more fragile, smaller packaging, harder to find old stocks. It's, it's very a, much a specialty format. And then it comes down to shooting today, in today's world, which is that in today's world, um, when you're shooting on these narrow gauge formats, you know, a brand new roll of 16 millimeter film and a brand new roll of Super 8, for instance, if you were to look at the cost per minute of finished product at 24 frames a second, 
the cost between shooting Super 8 and 16 millimeters very, very close. Much closer than it's ever been before. And that's because Kodak simply just charges a lot of money for Super 8 stock nowadays, and the labs do too because it's a specialty product. And the reality is they don't make a lot of money on processing and transferring one roll of film. So but with 16 millimeter, they can do, you know, it's 100 feet versus, you know, 50 feet. So the cost for them to process this roll of film is about equal, which means that Super 8 is kind of priced to a higher market than its value. Because back in the day, you'd buy a roll of film for, you know, $7, $8, and then you would process it for a couple dollars and get it back, and 20 bucks in the hole, and you've got your roll of film, but it's not like that anymore. Now, of course, with 16 millimeter, the cameras are a lot bigger. So um, this is a K3, and the K3 is a relatively large camera compared to a Super 8 camera. And so, you know, that's one of the things about 16 millimeter that kind of throws people off. Um, you know, there's no built-in light meter. There's no automatic exposure. There's no automatic focus. Um, you know, it's a, it's a whole other world. It's a more professional world. In fact, I would argue the K3 is the cheapest professional camera on the market today. You can get a K3 on eBay for three or $400 in great condition, ready to go. Can you even get a Bill U Super 8 camera on eBay for three or four hundred dollars? That works? Probably not. In fact, last time I checked, the prices of the Bill U cameras were a little bit more in the six, seven hundred dollar range for a good one that works with a decent lens. And now you're still shooting a Super 8. So yes, Super 8 cameras are cheaper than 16 millimeter cameras. You can buy a Shika 600 like this one for not much money, hundred bucks, and the likelihood it works is pretty high. I mean, this one I've had for as long as, as I've been alive. And as a consequence, it's been through a lot of shit as a kid and it still runs great. So yes, if you look around, you can probably find a decent Super 8 camera for cheap money. So that's one benefit of Super 8, buying a cheap camera. The problem is you can't really get a quality camera like the Bolex in Super 8. They just don't make it. The Bolex is an amazing camera and my electronic EBM model here, which allows for a bayonet mount and electronic operation um, with a lot of really neat features for filmmakers who want to shoot more sync sound stuff. I really, really think that the Bolex is kind of that bridge. Now, obviously today these are expensive on eBay. The thing is you can get a lower end H16 wind up Bolex on eBay or maybe in other places for not too much more than a Super 8 Bill U. So the way I look at Super 8 and 16 is that for certain price points, one format's better than the other one. So at the real low end price point, there's no doubt in my mind, Super 8's the way to go. If you're just starting out, you just want to play with film, you can buy a cheap camera and you can go shoot some Super 8 and be good, right? But, and that's, that's the base level. And then with 16 millimeter, you know, to get in, you gotta spend two or 300 bucks, right? So that's, 16 millimeter doesn't trump Super 8 until you spend three or 400 dollars on a camera. How many people actually spend that kind of money on a fancy camera like a BU or a Braun? I don't know, I really don't. I talk to people online, it seems that people do buy them and do own them. I don't know if those people shoot with them. Maybe they just buy them to collect them, I don't know, but if you're gonna spend $1,000 on a Super 8 camera, you can get a really good 16 camera for $1,000. You know, you can get an H16 reflex model that's good to go, you know, for, for about $1,000. To me, one of the biggest problems with Super 8 is that Super 8 looks too noisy and grainy and, and it's very difficult to get a stable image. It looks too home movie-ish and it drives people away from perhaps buying into shooting on film. People who don't know anything about it, who are just starting out, look at Super 8 and they go, okay, this is cool, it's home movie-ish, but is that all it does? But with 16 and even a cheaper camera like a K3, you can get some amazing imagery with this camera for not much money. And this is why I like to push people into 16 from the beginning, from the very, very beginning. Once you're in the 16 millimeter world, I don't think you're ever gonna go to Super 8. Because once you're there, you're basically saying, this is great, I love where I'm at, you know? I've got my K3 or my Bolex, I can get film on eBay for cheap money, I can process it locally at a shop, I can um, make it 
uh, reversal if I want. I can shoot reversal stock and I can project it on a projector or I can transfer for cheap money as well and I can edit my film digitally and it's very modern in that way as well. I can get a viewer and I can view my film and rewind it and splice it without it getting too damaged and dirty as I'm splicing it. With Super 8, it's hard to do that. So there's a lot that can be said about just sticking with this great format because with 16, at least you know that you're gonna get a product that's going to look pretty good. And a lot of people, what they do is that they just don't know what to buy when they first get started. And I always just tell people, start with 16, start with a K3, you can go on eBay, they're 300 bucks every day of the week, just buy one, I'll give you some film stock to play with, and go have some fun. The other problem, of course, is that Super 8 cameras are mostly all electronic. There are very, very few non-electronic Super 8 cameras made. They do exist, but there's very, very few of them. But you can get into 16 cameras that are wind up and they're just gonna work and they're gonna work forever because as long as they're maintained and lubricated, they're gonna just keep working, it's just a spring. But with Super 8 cameras, electronics fail and they're so fragile and so poorly made because they were designed for, to be mass produced that you really don't get the same kind of quality and product. So you could buy two or three Super 8 cameras to get one that works. And it's the same with the projectors. Super 8 projectors have belts and they have a lot of plastic gears and the plastic gears wear out over time and the belts totally fail and disintegrate. So it's very rare to buy a U Super projector that's in good shape. Some of them kind of work and then some of them don't work at all and you gotta replace those belts and you gotta do all sorts of plastic gluing or replacing of those plastic gears, which really sucks. 16 millimeter on the other hand, you can get an old projector from World War II like this one, you know, at a friend's house or, or through Craigslist or, you know, um, at a yard sale for peanuts. And this thing will run forever, literally forever. There's nothing in this box that won't last for the next hundred years. No plastic gears anywhere, all metal, and the thing just runs and runs and runs. You just lubricate it and you're good to go. For me, it's like you enter in the Super 8 world and it's like, you're dealing with all these little fragile pieces, but with 16, especially with wind-up cameras and old-school projectors, you're not really dealing with much fragility. Heavier, bigger, yes, but you're paying for smaller, lighter weight when you buy an Icky or one of the newer projectors. And the Ickies have a lot of the same problems that these newer Super 8 projectors have. They have a lot of belts and crack gears, and why do you want to deal with that? I have 16 million projectors that go back to the 60s and before, and they all work great today. There's no belts in them. They're all direct drive. It's amazing. So I look at it as a choice. Do you want to spend a lot of time and energy trying to get a narrow gauge format working, or do you want to spend less time getting it working and more time enjoying yourself shooting on the film? If you're a beginner and you've never shot anything on still film before, or you've never shot anything related to motion picture film before, I think that you should start with Super 8 and get a good feel for what it's like, process the film, transfer it to video, understand what you're dealing with before moving up. Now, if you're somebody who's shot still film before or somebody who knows a little bit about the photogrammetric process, maybe has a light meter already or knows somebody you can get a light meter from and you have a little bit of money and you wanna actually get into it for real, then start with 16, ignore Super 8 even existing, just get into 16 as fast as you can. The skills you gain by shooting on Super 8 aren't going to move to other formats, okay? With 16 millimeter, when you get a real 16 millimeter camera that's all manual, you're gonna, have to, you're, you're gonna have to learn how to use a light meter. You're gonna have to learn how to set your stop correctly on the camera. You're gonna have to learn about ISO. You're gonna have to learn about threading the camera. If you have a projector, you're gonna have to learn about threading the projector. 16 millimeter uses real splicers, the same splicers they use for 35 millimeter. You know, it's very much akin to working on a larger format like 35. And so you start with a K3 and then you buy a Bolex and then you buy maybe an Airy M or, or you know, maybe an older BL um, and you work your way up the ladder. And over the years, sure, you might spend 10 grand on shooting on 16 millimeter, but those skills you learn by shooting on 16 are gonna translate to professional shoots in ways that learning on Super 8 will not. So home movie world, just for fun, don't care about really filmmaking, professional filmmaking world where we begin. This is where it all starts. So I hope that differentiates the two formats really good. And I hope that 
you can look at this video and maybe hopefully decide which direction you want to go as a filmmaker. Whether you just want to mess around with the format just to shoot some film, or do you really care about your career and learning how to physically shoot on film? That's the real thing. So I'm Tyler Purcell, and thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.